And what really struck me was when they would come back the next year and be like, Mike, my meadow turned out fantastic. Your advice was great. The flowers did great. You know, it was really powerful seeing the connection. Welcome to The Art of Gardening. I'm your host, Melissa Lala Johnson, and I am so excited to have Mike Lazzotti from American Meadows here with us today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join me. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So I was just telling Mike before we went live that um, one of the very first seed companies I ever purchased seed from very happily and very successfully was American Meadows when I decided to do some small patches of um, wildflowers. And um, if you don't know about American Meadows, you should. You can check them out on Instagram. And then Mike also has his own Instagram page, um, Mike the Seed Man that um, he has such tremendous experience and expertise in wildflower meadow planting. So let's dive right into that. Why don't you tell us about American Meadows and your relationship with them? Sure. Um, so I have been in the seed industry my entire life. Um, I started working at American Meadows when I was 13 years old. And I've only had one job in my life. Um, and that's really working at American Meadows. And um, so I started when I was 13, um, in the basement, we had a retail store and I would come in on the weekends in high school and I would pack seed and I got to know. So a funny story is, you know, I'm a teenager. I would say at the time I wasn't exactly big into gardening, but if you laid a hundred seeds out on a table, I could identify every single seed, but I had no idea what it actually looked like for, from a flower. So I learned flowers kind of the opposite of everybody else. Most people take a guidebook and they go out into a field. They're like, oh, that's a daisy and that's a red poppy and lupin. And I kind of learned the opposite of learning everything from seed first and then kind of working my up to, oh, that's what a poppy looks like or that's what a lupin looks like. When I was a teenager, I would, when my shift was over, I'd go out into our, our test gardens and I would go out and, 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 and learn them from what they look like when they bloomed. But uh, it's kind of a funny story. But um, yeah, I worked there my entire life. The owners, the founders of the business, Ray and Shy Allen, um, when the opportunity came up, when we, we were one of the first gardening companies, American Meadows and AmericanMeadows.com, to sell our products on the internet going back to 1999. And um, when things went on the internet, as you can imagine, it kind of took off pretty quickly. And um, the opportunity came up to buy the company and myself and my business partner, Ethan Platt, um, acquired American Meadows in 2009. Uh, and there were six of us then. And um, we now have over 100 employees. We own two other gardening companies as well. And I guess the rest you can say is history. But um, it's been quite a journey, you know, through those years, talking to hundreds and thousands of gardeners all around the world, literally. And um, it, it's been fun. I think for me at an early age, the connection um, of gardening and the joy it brings to people uh, was really moving. Um, and I can tell you a little story about that too, Melissa, if you want to hear that. Um, yeah, so again, when I was a teenager, we had this retail store. People, locals would come in and they would buy the seed and, and go out and plant it. And, you know, when I was a teenager, 17, 18, and I'm giving them advice, but you're always kind of like, like, Am I really giving them the right advice? Is this going to work kind of thing? And, and what really struck me was when they would come back the next year and be like, Mike, my meadow turned out fantastic. Your advice was great. The flowers did great. You know, it was really powerful seeing the connection that the garden um, and the meadow and the, and the enjoyment that people got from planting flowers was really something that, that hit home to me and really struck a chord. And I was like, wow, this is, this is fun. And it's very powerful, you know, and, and how much people enjoy gardening and, and the feelings that it, it brings out in people um, was really telling from a, a young age. And I was like, wow, this, this could be a really gratifying um, uh, career. And then, of course, the business side of it, too. And I just kind of think had the, the perfect mix there. And, um, and yeah, I've been doing it my entire life. <laughs> So, so take us fun. to, take us to, you know, when I, I have tried multiple times, um, you know, to do larger expansive areas of planting and sometimes it's succeeded and sometimes not. Can you tell us if someone's going to be selecting an area to start a meadow and kind of tell us for those who may not be familiar with, 
what a meadow may look like. Like what exactly is a meadow? Um, what are the benefits of having a meadow on your property? And then what, sh how, what are the beginning steps of finding the perfect spot to do it? Sure. So um, as you mentioned, I was fortunate enough to write a book about the subject. And I think what's really unique about my book and my perspective on the word, there you go, the word meadows, when you hear it and how it's defined versus how I interpret it is, and again, this is just all through my experience with talking with customers is the definition of meadows in my book can be anywhere from a planter box to a couple of acres, you know? And so I don't get too hung up on the term meadow and that you have to have a specific size in order to, you know, plant a meadow or whatever, you know, anywhere where you could put some seed down um, and be successful and create flowers and habitat and, and, and enjoyment for yourself would, would fit my definition of meadow. I think getting more specifically to your question, Melissa, in regards to how do you get started and, and, you know, how big does the air have to be? I think the first thing is always um, setting the correct expectation um, for the project you want to take on. And what I mean by that is I might have someone who has two acres, you know, or an acre or a large area, which can be somewhat overwhelming if you've never done a gardening project before. And my goal is always wanting to set you up to succeed. I want you to be happy. I want this to be successful. I want you to get hooked on gardening for life. And so sometimes even if you have a large area, it might be best to actually start small and test or work your way into it because you can never really go wrong with starting small, proving the concept, learning along the way. And then as you have success and you build up your confidence, you take the next step to expand it. So you start with a hundred square feet, then you go to a thousand square feet, then 10,000 and so on versus biting off too much and then having a negative experience overall, like too ambitious. Because at the end of the day, I think when it comes to gardening, we all love, we all want to be successful. We all love the idea of growing a meadow or growing our own vegetables or whatever. But there's also this thing called life that gets in the way. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times people, the, the idea is there, but then the execution kind of fails because, oh, I got busy and all that weeding that I wanted to do during the summer, you know, just didn't happen. And then they come back like, yeah, I was kind of bummed and disappointed and I'm not sure I want to do it anymore. And so, I think is, you know, starting is setting the proper expectation and giving them a roadmap to succeed. And I don't care how big or small the area is, you know, as long as I can accomplish and begin that, you know, th put those steps in place, usually will end up being a successful um, experience for them. And, you know, and from there, once we talk about the size and stuff, we can get into the details of how important it is to prepare the area properly and um, you know, and sowing the seed properly and that kind of stuff. But it's always setting expectation first, you know, and so, like I said, a lot of times people will come to me and like, Mike, I, I, I have a large area, but we start smaller than expected. And it makes sense to them. You know, when I say, Hey, you know, cause it's a lot to go out and prep, you know, 10,000, 20,000 square feet or whatever it is. And just wanting to set the proper expectation to start usually will lead to them having success in the short term, but then also leading for success in the long term too, and then getting ultimately getting them hooked on gardening, which is what my goal is. So you mentioned your book. Um, I am a proud owner of your book. Um, I think I Thank got this on much. Amazon. It was on Amazon, right? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Yep. Yeah, all major booksellers, and Amazon, etc. Yep. Yeah, this book, it's called Mini Meadows, and it literally takes you step by step. So we're gonna go through some just kind of basic steps today. But this book is everything you need to create your own meadow. And it takes you step by step through every single step and then the different flowers and the, the site prep and all the good stuff. So we're going we're gonna to touch on a couple of these things today. But if it is something you're interested in looking for, um, I do highly recommend that you go on to Amazon and look up Mini Meadows by Mike Lozati and get this for yourself. Um, so let's talk about the prep of the area and the soil and what does that look like? Because sometimes I know in my experience, you don't know if you're supposed to be tarping areas and allowing things yeah. to grow underneath. Are we supposed to be tilling? Are we supposed to be digging? What are we supposed to do to get, to get success? Sure. So certainly the most important um, step when 
creating a meadow, mini meadow, whatever you want to call it, is the preparation. And that is the better that you can prepare the area, getting rid of the existing competition there, the grass, the weeds, or whatever's growing there, to expose some bare soil, the better results your planting is going to yield, both in the short and the long term. So how you go about doing that, well, a lot of times just depend on how big the area might be. You know, if it's 50 square feet, you might be able to go out there and get rid of that grass just with a steel rake and kind of rip it up. Um, there's a number of different ways which the book goes into on how you can prepare an area. And as you as you just mentioned, touches on things like tilling, solarization, using organic um, um, sprays, potentially uh, sod cutters. There's a number of different ways you can go about doing it. But I always stress with people regardless of which method you use, make sure you spend a little extra time during that preparation stage, because again, that's important. You know, getting back to setting the proper expectation, right off the bat, people will call me and say, Mike, I love the idea of planting a mini meadow and I'm going to buy the seed, but I actually don't want to do any work to prepare it. I'm just going to throw it out on my front lawn and expect flowers to come up. And I tell them, save your money, don't buy the seed because you're going to, you're setting yourself up to fail. There is just like in anything, you, there is a little work that has to happen. And preparing the area is really important. So in my book, when we go through the different methods, whichever one you choose, always tell people to spend a little more time, whether it is tilling the area, whether it is solarization, whatever the preparation method you choose, depending on the size, spend a little time there because I can tell you for a fact, you'll be rewarded um, you know, as your meadow begins to develop, not only in the first year, but in second and successive years. So it's always important. Um, and again, the preparation methods can vary depending on the size of the area you might be dealing with. So, Okay. So then if someone was going to clear, say you had an area and, and it was kind of, you know, throughout the winter months, it kind of clears out and then you're able to plant seed. Is it advised? Are you, do people have success if you are in an area where you can just kind of throw the seed down if the soil hasn't been loosened at all? Or do you recommend always having that soil loosened to some extent? We do always recommend loosening that surface layer of growth because what that does, it helps with not only accepting the seed, but good seed to soil contact, which is, which is important, which will speed up germination. Now there are cases like when somebody calls me and they're sowing on a slope, um, sometimes it can be hard to loosen up that surface layer on a slope. Can you still sow that? Absolutely. Will your seed still come in? Absolutely. But what you might find is the germination times could vary on seed that's been sown on an area that's been prepared and that surface layer is soft and it's been compressed in with good seed to sow contact versus an area that's sloped where you were able to sow but you weren't able to compress it. You might see that seed take an extra week, two weeks, three weeks to germinate, just slower to develop versus an area that's flat and it's been prepped properly and sown and the area is soft. So you have you can have to see some of those variances, but we always do recommend if possible, if you can loosen up that surface layer again to um, help absorb that seed once it's being sown, because that good seed to soil contact is important um, and can really help in, in establishment and quick germination, especially those first few weeks after sowing. So when I've done this at my place, I've had, I did a very small area that was maybe, you know, a um, hundred square feet. And when I sure. tried it, it was, I was able to water it and I was able to really weed it and take care of it. And it was fabulous. I mean, absolutely fabulous. The seed was fantastic. The flowers, very colorful, a great, a great arrangement. My question to you is if you're going to be doing something in an area where you may not have irrigation or have a hose mm -hmm. that you can get it to, how important sure. is the watering if you are to pick something that's like a drought resistant type of seed pack? Sure. So watering is important, but we have plenty of people who the whole objective of sowing a meadow is I don't want to water. You know, I don't want to have the maintenance of a, of a lawn. I want things that are water wise. Um, and so uh, a tip I give often is that when you are thinking about planting in an area that you might not have access to water to, is planning your sowing around some moisture in the forecast. So what I mean by that is, let's assume it's springtime and you're thinking about doing a, an area and you don't have access to water, but there's some rain in the forecast. You would go out and sow your seed dirt that day or, or later, whenever that rain is. And most of the times... And again, in most places, you are getting somewhat of a consistent rainfall from Mother Nature in the spring anyway, you know, the rainy season or whatever. Um, 
So you can take advantage of that moisture from Mother Nature, which will help stimulate germination. Um, and in most cases, you're going to have to, you'll have plenty of moisture from Mother Nature alone and you won't have to worry about watering at all. So that's always a little tip I give people. It is important, ideally, to get some moisture down, you know, within those first few weeks after watering, because again, that's going to promote germination. And the quicker we can get those seeds up and germinating and on their way, you know, the less reliant they'll be on water moving forward. So. And then what about sunlight? So in some areas here at my place, we have a lot of trees around and I would really love to have more flowers back on the tree line. Are there, are there flowers and seed packs that are available through American Meadows for areas just like that, that may be a little more drought, but then less sun? Yeah, absolutely. We offer currently, you know, close to 60 different types of mixtures. And you'll notice when you go to American Meadows website, we first start by breaking it down geographically. And the beauty of wildflowers um, unlike some other vegetation, such as perennials and so on, they're not as zone specific. So people always ask like, why don't you guys have these in zones? We do have a zone finder, but the beauty is there's a lot of meadow flowers that can grow over multiple zones. So we've always found that regionality tends to work a little bit better for us. So you go to our site and you'll find different regions. So Northeast or Midwest or whatever. Um, and then from there, yeah, we have not only water rise or drought resistant solutions, but we have some that will do well with only a couple hours of sunlight or, you know, three or four hours of sunlight. The one thing to keep in mind is most of our meadow flowers that we um, specialize in will require at least two to three hours of sunlight in order for germination to take place. But that said, if you are dealing with an area where it's full canopy of trees and so on, you can still establish flowers there. They might just be more of what we would call woodland wildflowers, things such as you know, trilliums or hepaticas and things like that, which, you know, they're just as beautiful, but you're getting into a, a little bit different type of um, flora there, but you could still do it. But we do have, uh, we have a partial shade mixture, which again would require at least two to three hours of sun a day um, for germination to take place. And one tip, Melissa, that I always um, talk to people about is when they call like in your situation where they're like, Mike, I don't know if it's, if something's going to grow there, I've got trees, um, it's shaded certain times of the day. A real simple rule of thumb I, I tell people is like, tell me what's growing under the area now. And if the area supports like grass and weeds and other vegetation, most of the time the area is getting more sunlight than people realize. If somebody says, yeah, Mike, there's trees and it's ver it's bare dirt, you know, that will use in, you know, maybe they've tried to grow stuff there in the past and it's just bare that usually tells me that there isn't enough sunlight getting there and they may go the woodland wildflower or plant material, which again, just have to factor. Sometimes it's a little more expensive, but you can usually find some solutions in some wildflowers that may grow in uh, a more wooded situation. So tell us about the benefits. In fact, I had a neighbor of mine who just started beekeeping and he had actually texted me the other night and said, hey, you know, I need some help. I'm, I'm starting these bees and I need to figure out what flowers and what plants. Of course, the first thing I did was send him to your website and said, you know, kind of yeah. check this out because you have the pollinator mixes and things. And some people grow around here. We have a lot of hunting that goes on for deer. So people are growing different types of flowers for deer. Um, what are some benefits in, in your experience of having, like why, what would be some other reasons someone would really want to consider uh, planting a meadow, um, if if you're using if you're using it for things like that or or something. Yeah, else. absolutely. It's a great question, Melissa. And, um, there's a couple things. Number one, again, I've been doing this for a long time, which is like too long because I still consider myself young. But I'm like, geez, how could I be doing this for like over 30 years? But I can tell you right now, the consumer has never been more in tune with the environment than they are now. We get caught, you know, every day calls, people want to do something good for the environment um, because they heard that there's a decline in monarchs or there's a decline in pollinators or, you know, the food that they're getting in the grocery store just doesn't taste the same, you know, it tastes funny and, or they may have heard about, you know, food contamination. So people want to do good for the environment, which is awesome. And when it comes to specifically flowers, certainly want to support pollinators like your your neighbor who's doing some beekeeping you know and wants to try to um you know help bee populations or you know produce his own honey things like that there's more and more of those so it's we've continued to not only with covid but we continue even before that a boom in 
meadow mixes and establishing habitat. You know, you can't ignore um, the the our population is going through the roof, and we're destroying habitat at crazy um, uh, amounts. And we need to restore that because it's impacting the pollinators. We're all aware of that, and so consumers are wanting to do something good for the environment. So you know, that is really strong. I don't want to call it a trend, but I guess for a lack of a better term, that's a, a trend that we continue to see. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, we have region specific pollinator mixes, one of the old, only seed companies that actually offer those right now. And, you know, we, we are selling thousands and thousands of pounds of them, you know? And so I think wanting to do something good for the environment, habitat creation, supporting monarchs and, and other pollinators, it's huge right now. And I don't see it going away anytime soon. Um, for better or worse. And so I think, you know, we are hearing and seeing more and more people call who want to do or have a cause behind their planting. It's not just, although we get plenty of people who call and just like, hey, I want to plant something just to have some bouquet on, on my dinner table at night, which is great. But this in tune with the environment. And then another piece, Melissa, I would say more and more so people are in tune with wanting to do something for themselves, for like their mental health to create some enjoyment for ourself. And, um, you know, that's something, I don't want to say it's new, but it's certainly something maybe I wasn't as, have been uh, as aware of in years past, but certainly um, hearing more and more people, you know, wanting to do something for mental health, for going out and enjoying that cup of coffee in the morning in sitting in their meadow, you know, um, a place to just go and relax and listen to the birds and nature around them and being able to do that by creating habitat, by putting in a meadow, um, really seeing some strong connections there. So those two certainly kind of come to the top of the list, in, in my opinion, and what we're hearing from our customers, which, which is exciting, but I think also circles back to when we started the conversation about why this is so gratifying for me and why I enjoy this so much, you know, the feedback we hear and the, the pictures that come in and the experience people tell, uh, it's pretty rewarding and, and pretty powerful at the same time. So big questions that I think are out there are when is the right time to plant seed? Because now I think this is a perfect time to have you right now because, you know, yeah. there's people planting seed now there's people that are going to start in the spring. So right now, what should we do? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, depending on where you are, spring is by far the most popular time to be sowing meadow, a meadow, and it's usually going to be when you're free of your last frost states, assuming you're going to sow directly onto the soil, which a high percentage of our customers too do. It's not very often that you're going to start a meadow indoors, like in flats and then transplant. It doesn't quite, that's more, keep that to your veggies and so on. So you're going to sow direct into the soil. You want the soil to have warmed up a bit. So a kind of a, a quick, again, little tip or rule of thumb is... Wherever you are, when you can put your tomato plants out into the ground is a good time to be sowing your meadow. So spring is certainly by far the most popular time, but also depending on where you are in the country, fall is another optimal time to be sowing seed as well too. But certainly, you know, here we are, I'm sitting here in Vermont and it's snowing and it's cold um, and I've got spring fever already, um, but I won't be sowing for, you know, until mid-May, end of April, May, depending on what what the weather's doing. But um, spring is certainly the time. Again, you want to be free of your last frost state and you could sow same time you put out your tomato plants, a rule of thumb. Now you could certainly begin to do some prepping this time. Well, not prepping, but begin to kind of map out, think about like, hey, what type of flowers do I want to put in my mix? Um, do I want to, you know, maybe create some pollinator habitat? How big of an area? That's going to be important. You know, go out, maybe you, you pace it length times width, because how big the area is, is going to determine how much seed you're going to need for the project. So it's always good, you know, you know, a month or two, create a little project list. Um, you can, again, go to our website, or if you picked up a copy of the book, you could begin to, to map out, like, how big is the area? Um you know, roughly how much sun might it be getting? Uh, what type of mix and flowers? Do you want annuals for quick color in the first year? Or are you thinking longevity with perennials? Because again, we have mixtures that are tailored to a lot of um, different planting situations. Um, so now, if you're still a few months away from planting is a good time to kind of begin to put together a list for that. What is the best way to distribute seed? What are some tips that you can give um, to getting the seed out there evenly? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a great question. So all the seed that we sell at American Meadows is 100% pure seed. There's no filler 
in any of our products. Unlike if you were to go to Home Depot or a big box store right now, and you were to pick up a bag of, you know, metal mix that you may be familiar with, most of those are about 90% filler, actually, if you read the fine print. And the reason is it has a dispersing agent in there. All the seed we sell is 100% pure seed. And the instructions that come with our seed mixes, we always recommend mixing your seed with, the, with builder sand or sandbox sand. And what that does is the density of that sand with the density of our seed, we find that it mixes well together. And when you begin dispersing it, you get nice, even distribution over the entire area. And we have some tips and tricks in our planting instructions. For instance, I recommend mixing your seed and sand together and then breaking it up into two equal parts or sometimes four equal parts and going over the area in multiple ways in multiple directions because what that does it kind of ensures you have a nice evenly sown meadow because one of the mistakes people will make sometimes is when they're following the instructions and they mix their seed with sand and let's say they're using a spreader which they've never used before and they're not familiar with the calibration and they put all the seed and sand into the spreader and they begin spreading it and what happens is it's calibrating it too thick and i can't tell you how many times people call and they're like mike i followed everything i went out i started sowing I only got over half the area and I'm all out of my seed mix. And it's hard to thin that out once you've sown it. So that's a little tip we'll give you there is once you've mixed your seed with sand, break it up into equal parts and you begin distributing it, go in multiple directions and multiple ways. And that will guarantee you a nice evenly sown meadow. So once your meadow is germinated, what is the expectation? How are we going to get the best rate of success as far as weeding? What do you recommend how do we manage that? That's a great question because I will tell you, most people who are putting in a meadow, their goal is not to do any weeding, you know? And so it's, imp I think a couple things come into play is setting the expectation on the type of seed mix that you're going to plant. And what I mean by that is if you, we know, so there's different life cycles, there's annuals, perennials, and biennials. And if you want color in the first year, you're going to have to plant annuals. Annuals are great not only to give you color, but they also suppress weeds when you're establishing a meadow. So you can kind of have the best of both worlds. So a lot of times what will happen with a meadow mix, and let's assume in this case it is a combination of annuals and perennials, those annuals are suppressing first year weeds, but there's still maybe some unwanted grass or weeds that are in the meadow. But with the height of those flowers, you actually don't end up noticing them. So again, you say, am I actually going to go out and weed that? Probably not. Like, I don't ever weed any of my meadows because, again, the the problem, like, I have problems with nut sedge, sedge grass, sometimes ragweed, but they tend to be smaller and shorter. So, like, are they present in there? Sure. But are they in abundance? No. Are they causing any issues? In my opinion, no. So I just kind of leave them there, you know. But our expectation is you're not going to weed. If you are planning to weed, a couple tips there, try to do it after you've had a rainfall because it's much easier to pull the root structures out. But the goal here isn't really to be pulling weeds. Now that said, Melissa, what's important, getting back to knowing the size of the area and sowing the proper amount of seed for the size of the area you have, that's important because what could happen is that, let's say you had 100 square feet, but you only planted enough seed for 10 square feet. Well, that leaves a lot of open area potentially for other unwanted weeds, to, things to come in, which i.e. could equal weeds or unwanted vegetation. That's when, so it's important getting back to when you're prepping your area to understand how big your area is and make sure you're buying enough seed to cover that proper amount. So one of the things that I love that you did this last season was with your adorable daughter, Sadie, you guys did your own meadow from scratch. I mean, you took a grass area right outside of the front yard of the house and yep. you kind of, can you talk a, a little bit about that and that experience? And then of course, bringing her into it and having your daughter uh, working it with you. Yeah. So I have a, my daughter, Sadie, who is now 12. Um, she been fortunate, like she enjoys gardening. She's enjoyed it from a young age. Um, I've for many years gone to her class and given presentations on it. And um, she, yeah, she gets out there and she sews and, and, and gets her hands dirty and stuff. And um, so on that note, um, we did a segment. There's a, um, a national show you might be familiar with called Growing a Greener World, Melissa, that Joe Lampel produces. Um, you can watch it on PBS. And um, 
we had her out there. We filmed a segment on that. We did it and it was a lot of fun. And so she'll get out there and get her hands dirty. But yeah, I mean, you know, you say like wanting to get kids involved, another way to get them involved in gardening and outdoor activity, um, putting a meadow in, you know, it's so easy. A kids can do it. Yeah. Something like that, you know? Um, and we go out, yeah, our, we live in a kind of a suburban area. And, um, when we moved in here 10 years ago, first thing, beautiful manicured lawn. And the first thing we did was rip the lawn out and we put a veggie garden in and we got a mini meadow. Now we keep, and we expand the meadow every year because again, it's, it's low maintenance and I have, you know, no watering and, and what it does to how much, you know, support pollinators and how many birds we go out there every day and there's monarchs and it's just, it's awesome. And, um, it's funny again, if you follow my Instagram, um, we have a lot of foot traffic neighbors and stuff are walking by all the time. The compliments we get, I had a note in my um, mailbox like a month ago, someone put in and said, because what we also do, we grow milk, we, patches of milkweed to support the monarchs. Someone put a note in my mailbox that says, please plant the monarchs again next year. We walk by every year and we love them. And it's just, it's fun. And, and um, you know, it's a great way for her to learn and, and understand nature. And um, yeah, we have a lot of fun doing it. Well, that's awesome. And that um, is chronicled on your personal page, which is Mike the Seed Man on yep. Instagram. Are you on Facebook as well? I am on Facebook, Mike the Seed Man as well, too. So they link to each other and stuff like that. So Awesome. And then, of course, American Meadows on um, Facebook and Instagram as well. Yep. So before Absolutely. we go, we are just out of time. Um, so our friends at Petra Tools wanted to make you a uh, gift for being a guest. So I have three products. We're going to run down here and let you pick your product. Okay. So first up is mulch glue. So Supermax mulch glue, this will keep your mulch in place. I don't know if you saw the most recent video I did, but this stuff is ridiculous. If you have washout or pets or whatever in different areas and you need to keep your mulch in one place, this is the stuff to do it. Second is one gallon of worm tea concentrate. So you know about this stuff, the worm castings. It does yep. miracles for everything, indoor, outdoor, foliar, drench, the whole thing. Or, and I think I probably know the answer to this one, but grass paint. So to take care of any areas in your grass where you haven't converted to a meadow, if you need to fix anything, pest areas, whatever it may be, this is the stuff you want. So Mike, the question of the hour, what's it gonna be? The worm casting. Where I knew it. I knew it. I would have bet money on that. So we will be uh, getting you your nice big gallon of worm tea um, and hopefully use it on your on your meadow this year. Absolutely. And have, have lots of good luck with it. Because what you said, too, is another great point. Like having these meadows, it attracts so many pollinators and birds. And it's like I feel like Snow White sometimes when I'm walking out in these areas and there's just like birds swooping down and the butterflies are around. And it's just it really creates a magical feel to a property. Yeah, it absolutely does. And, and it really doesn't take much, you know, and, you know, you've got just a small area and you plant some flowers and next thing you know, you know, you find, you see some butterflies you haven't seen before, or, you know, some winged friends you haven't seen before. And, you know, it, it's, you can get a lot of enjoyment out of it. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So if someone decides they want to do this and they haven't had a chance to pick up your book, um, I know you've mentioned multiple times, which I have also taken advantage of, is calling American Meadows because you've got people yep. on staff that are able to help with any questions and actually help your customers, educate your customers and help them learn about um, your products, correct? That's exactly correct. Yeah, we have customer service from nine in the morning till seven at night. I mean, we're gearing up for our super busy season. And yeah, absolutely. Don't hesitate to call. You can also americanmeadows.com we have great a plethora of information there planting videos lots of videos i've done there um that walk you through step by step um things you can print off for yourself but um tons of information but you can always call and get a, a live person that can can walk you through as well too sir well fantastic information this has been a long time coming thank you so much for your time and all of your expertise and uh we will look forward to seeing your meadow grow again this year bigger and better than ever Absolutely. I'm, I'll give you a little sneak peek, but we'll be expanding it again this year quite significantly, actually. So, um, yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, I, I Last year, I documented the whole meadow from start to finish, uh, giving weekly updates. And um, it's a fun way to learn and, and would encourage people, again, if they do have questions, you can reach out via um, social channels as well, too. So, Awesome. Well, thanks so much again for your time, and we will uh, see you soon. Thanks again, Melissa. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Bye-bye.